Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, very glad to be here and a uh, warm welcome to our closing lecture today on international marine environmental law in time of the triple planetary crisis. As um, uh, Professor Sciano di Pepe already mentioned, uh, it is a, a, a new approach uh, um, from a traditional law of the sea point of view. So uh, I hope uh, I can uh, catch your um, sympathy for, for this approach. Um, and you may ask yourself, what, what may I expect from today? And uh, I can tell you that we are, um, well, particularly because of the time restraints, it's a quick ride through international marine environmental law, as you can imagine, of course. Uh, we will not be able to go much into detail, but uh, the intention of the today's lecture is actually to give you an idea of uh, uh, different instruments uh, to protect the marine environment uh, in different international fora and the uh, interlinkage uh, between those fora, particularly um, over the last uh, um, basically uh, two, three decades, um, we will see in the beginning that uh, the start of uh, international marine environmental law was very much, um, um, you could say, well, um, focused on certain uh, uh, topics in certain fora and they didn't really communicate much. And uh, the international community has changed its uh, approach and its understanding, so this is actually the reason why we have uh, a different attitude towards international mar marine environmental law today. And this is also the second part of this lecture, uh, which uh, is going to show you the uh, different, um, you could say, uh, understanding of the past, well, four years or so, so basically since the uh, uh, beginning of the 20s. 20s. So, um, again, uh, uh, very much uh, thank you to uh, Lorenzo, to uh, uh, inviting me and uh, um, as uh, Lorenzo already mentioned uh, we are um, uh, well we know each other for for uh, a long long time uh, we met at, at IMO at the International Maritime Organization and this is also where we are going to start uh, just in a in a few seconds but before um, I start with the with the contents I would like to uh, uh, give you a, a short overview. Uh, Lorenzo already uh, told you that I'm a professor of international law at the University of Applied Sciences in Bremerhaven uh, since two, two, 2007 and I'm a director of the Institute uh, for the Law of the Sea and International Marine Environmental Law uh, ISRIM in, in, in Bremen. And uh, uh, well basically um, this is uh, a topic which has been uh, well the core the core of my my um, professional career you could say uh, from the very beginning in the uh, 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 mid late 1990s uh, uh, until today uh, environmental law particularly the marine environmental law has been on my top agenda so I'm happy to speak about that uh, today uh, as I've uh, mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, International Maritime Organization, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the very early years, you could say, of uh, um, uh, well, marine uh, environmental protection, uh, even though we cannot really speak of a, of a known field of environmental law at that time. And uh, I will explain a little why I've also mentioned here uh, uh, pre or why I've titled that as a pre-Stockholm phase. Well, first of all, after the Second World War and uh, uh, before uh, the uh, United Nations uh, Conference uh, on the Human Environment in Stockholm, uh, I, uh, I do see um, a, a strong focus 
of the international community on uh, the uh, protection of the marine environment, uh, environment from pollution uh, by oil. So uh, that was actually uh, a need seen by the international community due to the um, increasing size of the vessels, uh, particularly the tankers as well as uh, uh, cargo, particularly in this kind of, uh, of course, crude oil, which uh, um, um, well, was uh, um, uh, different from, from the time uh, before which uh, also had some, some risks, of, of course, but because of the uh, quantity uh, coming up in the um, uh, 50s and 60s, um, the international community recognized the uh, uh, important need to uh, regulate uh, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, danger or this risk. And, um, particularly when it came in 1967 to the Torrey Canyon disaster, uh, the international community uh, understood that there is a strong need for, for action. So uh, basically you can uh, see that uh, that was uh, a lot um, done at IMO um, and uh, this is also where, as we have explained, we started uh, 25 years ago um, and uh, IMO was actually uh, established as a technical body uh, by the international community and uh, the international community wasn't very happy to, to um, establish such an institution at all because of uh, um, the uh, lobby, you could say, the strong uh, uh, shipping owners and the uh, um, um, flag states were very uh, cautious in, in allowing regulations on an international scale uh, with regard to their uh, freedoms of navigation. So this is what they feared ba basically that there is a, a kind of a, a limitation somehow to their uh, uh, freedom and um, uh, that's uh, basically the, the, the starting point of, uh, of the uh, IMO mandate on the environment. In 1972, a lot changed. Uh, with the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, which took place in Stockholm in 1972, um, we are also speaking of the uh, very birth of international environmental law as if somehow field of law, as you can, as you can say. And uh, um, I've just given one example here of, uh, from principle seven of the declaration of the, of the conference, which reads, states shall take all possible steps to prevent pollution of the seas by substances that are liable to create hazards to human health, to harm living resources and marine life, to damage amenities or to interfere with other legitimate uses of the sea. So um, when we are speaking of the birth of international environmental law, I should also mention that uh, uh, this is uh, something which um, uh, 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 was very much restricted, you could say, or limited to, um, to the the understanding of the international community of the environment always in relation uh, to the human element, so uh, to human health, to uh, uh, economical interests and so on. So uh, we are not speaking of really international environmental law as we know it today, but that's uh, just as a, as a starting point, as I said. Stockholm was uh, important uh, in many ways, and I've given here some uh, examples of, of uh, action, um, like the action plan or the general principles uh, adopted during the uh, conference. One important uh, um, uh, institution, but I'm not focusing very much on institutions today, so I haven't mentioned uh, that. But still, I should say that uh, with the Stockholm Conference, 
Uh, we had also the establishment of the United Nations Environment Programme, um, well, uh, which uh, is based in, in Nairobi, and which plays an important role, uh, and we will um, come across uh, UNEP a couple of times during this uh, presentation. So, um, I would also like to uh, mention uh, uh, in this context and to uh, underline what I've just said with regard to uh, the uh, um, environmental protection from a very uh, uh, human-oriented uh, perspective. Um, that is recommendation uh, 92 of the action plan, which reads the marine environment and all the living organisms which it supports our vital importance to humanity and all people have an interest in ensuring that this envir environment is so managed that its quality and resources are not impaired. This applies especially to coastal nations which have a particular interest in the management of coastal area resources. The capacity of the sea to assimilate wastes and render them harmless and its ability to regenerate natural resources are not unlimited. Proper management is required and measures to prevent and control marine pollution must be regarded as an essential element in the management of the oceans and seas and their natural resources. And well, if you read it today, uh, you can already um, feel the um, atmosphere, you could say, or the, the understanding of parts of the international community which led to the today's situation. And we will see uh, uh, at the um, uh, latest slides uh, where we are standing today, particularly when it comes to the discussion on the uh, triple planetary crisis. So Stockholm, as I said, was a starting point, and uh, um, uh, I, I think it's uh, um, it's of course nice to to have such a such a, a date, even though we understand that nothing in in uh, uh, well international law comes just out of the blue. Obviously, there has been a kind of a progress and a, a, a um, well, um, you could say a. Um, yeah, a pro pro process uh, on on the environmental um, uh, protection view, you could say. But um, Stockholm has made uh, the international community aware of the needs, and uh, in the uh, uh, post-Stockholm era, you could say, uh, we have a lot of um, uh, breakthroughs uh, which were important uh, um, uh, to achieve and uh, well you could say without um, uh, Stockholm this course might even not have taken place because if, uh, if we think of uh, 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 the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea for example um, uh, and, its, uh, and its important um, uh, conference uh, three uh, the period from 1973 to 1982, uh, UNCLOS III, was uh, the very important uh, step, of course, with regard to achieving uh, uh, UNCLOS. But uh, I'm not concentrating too much on, on UNCLOS today. You have heard a lot on this uh, over the past uh, uh, weeks and months, so I'm not going to um, um, uh, talk about that too much. But of course, uh, it is a frame, and you have learned that UNCLOS is a, f a framework convention, an umbrella convention, and uh, 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 it is uh, the um, uh, um, uh, well, the very basis, you could say for uh, all the activities and, and uses uh, of the sea. But there are different um, instruments. I would also like to mention the 1973 International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, um, which is a, a, um, a further development, or you could say it an upgrade of, of oil pole. 
um, which was, uh, as I've uh, showed in the um, slide on the uh, early stage, uh, actually uh, the, um, uh, was only focused on the pollution uh, uh, from ships by, uh, by oil, and uh, now we are uh, going beyond that. We will look into that uh, uh, on, a, on a separate slide. Still, also, the uh, post-Stockholm era was very much influenced by uh, disasters, and I should mention in this uh, context the Amokadis disaster and the Axon Valdez disaster in 1978 uh, uh, and in 89. But you can see uh, from, from the uh, bullet points here that uh, we have a, a progress after Stockholm, um, and also in, in 1982 uh, with the, you could call it um, uh, uh, the Stockholm Plus 10 conference, uh, which is uh, the UNEP Governing Council session of a special character, um, is uh, to um, um, well celebrate the anniversary, the 10th anniversary of the, uh, of the Stockholm conference. As I've mentioned, uh, MAPOL uh, is one of the key uh, instruments uh, with regard to uh, international uh, uh, marine environmental law. And uh, it is, uh, uh, over the years, um, uh, it has grown over the years, uh, has become the most important and most comprehensive um, conventions uh, in, this, in this field. And you can see it is far beyond uh, uh, oil pollution nowadays. I've also mentioned uh, the uh, UNEP Governing Council. Uh, some of you might know uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, institution as uh, UNEA, the United Nations uh, Environment Assembly, how it is called today. So this is uh, basically the, the, the old name, you could say. And uh, in, uh, in 1982, it already uh, um, uh, showed its um, uh, uh, attitude, you could say, towards uh, uh, the, the oceans, trends and problems and priorities for action. So um, this is basically uh, the uh, uh, 82 situation, so the, the uh, year of the adoption of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So uh, I would um, um, like to um, make you aware or sensitize uh, you that this is always um, uh, occurring at the same time, so in parallel uh, fora, you could say. So here we are in UNEP fora, whereas uh, uh, UNCLOS is uh, a lot uh, focused on Doha laws, the division on ocean uh, and a law of the sea and ocean affairs in New York. And there are different institutions and fora which we are uh, touch upon uh, during the next uh, uh, hour or so. So UNCLOS, uh, uh, I don't have to mention uh, a lot on that. You have, uh, you have uh, done your part uh, during uh, this, uh, this course, but I would like to uh, recall part 12, of course, on the protection and preservation of the marine environment, and particularly article 192 with the general obligation. So states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. and. Uh, um, I would also like to uh, um, um, uh, indicate we have 1982 as the date of adoption and we have 1994 with regard to entering into force. And we will come back to that, why I particularly stress uh, those years because if, as I said, my uh, presentation is about the interlinkages of different instruments in fora. Um, here you have uh, again a, a little illustration on uh, on the development of UNCLOS, and uh, uh, you have seen that everything takes quite a while in international law in general, and uh, uh, that is also uh, true for uh, the law of the sea. 
So when we are speaking about the 1950s for the uh, starting of the preparatory works of the International Law Commission and uh, until uh, 1994, uh, the entering into force of UNCLOS, uh, we are speaking of, uh, of a period of, of, of uh, 44 years. When we are speaking about environmental law, we have a different um, time scale, you could say. And that is uh, something which we had to, to learn in inter international law, because of um, when, uh, uh, when uh, well, you could say, uh, the, uh, uh, when we were still in the early years, you could say, of international environmental law, uh, it was usual to say, well, international law uh, develops or occurs in decades. But we can see that this is not true any longer. And uh, the international community uh, is faster nowadays. And uh, the development of international environmental law, and obviously also, uh, of course, uh, this is true for international marine environmental law, has prog progressed. In a, in a very short while and uh, so this is also something which gives us perhaps some hope that we will be able to tackle uh, the problems we have today and we will touch uh, on this uh, again uh, at a later stage of this presentation so why why do I why do I say um, uh, 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 1994 is important uh, First, let us go two years back, and that is 1992. And this is the next important step in the development or the, you could say, the understanding within the international community when it comes to uh, the development of international environmental law slash international marine environmental law. And that is uh, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. In, in, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, so this is uh, also call, called the Earth Summit. And this was a, a very important conference which led to a lot of uh, uh, output, you could say. So we have the Rio Declaration, we will uh, um, uh, discuss a few things on that. We have Agenda 21, we have uh, the establishment of the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, which is very important, particularly when it comes to marine areas within national jurisdiction. We have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, we have the UN Commission on Sustainable Development. And we do have a, a very important starting point regarding the negotiations for the establishment of the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. So basically, the early 1990s are, um, uh, are an important uh, impulse, you could say, uh, uh, which the, the international community set to further develop uh, this uh, particular field of international law, which we could even uh, call at that time already a, a field within international law. So um, CBD, as I've uh, uh, already mentioned, is, uh, 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 is particularly of importance with regard to um, uh, uh, marine areas within national jurisdiction. So um, um, when we consider UNCLOS as an umbrella convention uh, uh, dealing with all activities, all uses, all marine areas we, we do have, we still understand that this is uh, um, a convention which allows um, um, or which, which gives indications but which does not really regulate, which does not really uh, 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 achieve um, uh, many many things in, in or, or uh, mentions many things much in detail, but it refers to other instruments. So uh, we can see that there is an interlinkage between that already, even though we do have different fora, and usually we do also have different competences when it comes to the national delegations. So basically, um, uh, let's take the example of, of, of Germany uh, uh, just to illustrate 
the challenges we do have within the national perspective. So when it comes, for example, to IMO, uh, we do have the Ministry uh, uh, for, for, for um, Traffic, which is uh, uh, responsible for, for IMO matters. We do have uh, the Ministry for Environment responsible for UNEP matters, and uh, this covers also CVD. When it comes to, for example, uh, law of the sea and DOA laws uh, in New York, then, for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is responsible. So you have a lot of competition already within, within the delegations, within the national perspective. And, well, just to make it even more difficult, you could say, uh, you just go on the well, EU level, uh, then you can see all the different ministries are meeting from each EU member state, then negotiating a, a perspective or a, or a, a position, and that makes it uh, really difficult sometimes to see, but also to convince that there is an interlinkage and an importance really to find a common position on certain certain issues. So, with 1992, as I said, um, we have the understanding that there is a, a component which ha has to be um, added to environmental protection, and that is development. And development has to be sustainable. This is the understanding, basically, of uh, or the outcome of the 1992 uh, uh, conference. And I've given you here three blocks, you could say, uh, of different types of uh, uh, conferences which took place on the uh, uh, international scene. And this is the uh, uh, the first is basically. Um, Stockholm and uh, uh, the conferences um, uh, um, uh, with the foundation of Stockholm. So, 72 in Stockholm, 92 Rio, 2002 Johannesburg, 12 is then Rio plus 20, giving the connection there again, and in 2022 uh, Stockholm plus 50. Um, so, you you have already there a kind of a tradition, you could say, or a type of um, building upon uh, uh, the, uh, the um, decade before and developing uh, international environmental law. You have uh, in 2015 um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Summit in New York which um, sets a different point. We will look into uh, the importance of this uh, conference um, just in a, in a second. Uh, and we do have as a third block uh, the United Nations Ocean Conferences, which have a special focus, well, you know it from, from the title, of course, on the seas and oceans. So this is something you have to keep in mind also when it comes to uh, uh, the development of, of instruments, when it comes to uh, um, uh, the development of uh, uh, different uh, uh, approaches by the international community. So this gives a, a momentum, you could say. This is usually a, a speeding up of developments which are constantly undergoing but still, they need sometimes some, some special date to, uh, uh, to come to a, a breakthrough, you could say. So, um, uh, uh, Rio Plus 20, uh, with the outcome document, the future we want, uh, I would like to mention here uh, Para 158, uh, 158 reads, we recognize that oceans, seas, and coastal areas form an integrated and essential component of the Earth ecosystem and are critical to sustaining it. And that international law, as reflected in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, 
provides the legal framework for the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans and their resources. We stress the importance of the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans and seas and of their resources for sustainable development, while at the same time protecting biodiversity and the marine environment and addressing the impacts of climate change. We therefore commit to protect and restore the health, productivity and resilience of oceans and marine ecosystems to maintain their biodiversity, enabling their conservation and sustainable use for present and future generations, and to effectively apply an ecosystem approach and the precautionary approach in the management in accordance with international law of activities having an impact on the marine environment to deliver all the three dimensions of sustainable development, which means in this, uh, 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 or which means economic, social, and env environmental aspects. So, 2012, 20 years, uh, uh, basically after after Rio. Uh, there is a different language. It's a different wording. You can you can. Uh, read a different understanding of the international community in those, in those uh, um, uh, formulations. And you can also see that, that there is a, um, another component which comes in, and this is basically uh, the social uh, component, which is also uh, recognized by the international community in the overall framework of sustainable development, you could say. And you already read things like um, uh, climate change, you read um, uh, biodiversity loss, you read pollution, and you read, of course, also um, the concept of the intergenerational equity, which is, of course, uh, an important factor nowadays, and which gives the speeding up we recognize uh, uh, latest uh, in the 2020s, but that I don't want to go too fast. So um, I would like to look into the um, uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was um, uh, uh, adopted in 2015. Um, the Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and um, I've just taken one example, which is in para 33. We are therefore determined to conserve and sustainably use oceans and seas and to protect biodiversity, ecosystems and wildlife. And uh, in this context, uh, we have also um, the uh, uh, sustainable development goals, which have given um, um, a priority to certain uh, uh, aspects uh, within international environmental law and of course uh, for our purpose here uh, goal 14 the, uh, 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 which is on the conservation and sustainable use of uh, 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 ocean seas and marine resources for sustainable development is of course a, 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 a very important step because it visualizes and, and it makes a, a very focus on certain uh, uh, aspects but also actions to be taken. So this is something which uh, made a big difference you could say and I've um, taken up here one example uh, also to show the interlinkage again uh, with one of the subparagraphs, you could say, of uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is 14.c, which reads, enhance the conservation and sustainable use of oceans and their resources by implementing international law as reflected in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which provides the legal framework for the conservation and sustainable use of oceans and their resources, as recalled in paragraph 158 of the future we want. And here we have, again, uh, uh, well, it's uh, 2015, so just a few years after, after 
uh, um, the um, Rio Plus 20 conference, uh, a reference back to that and also to interconnect again uh, to make sure that um, uh, uh, we are not challenging in the context of UNEP uh, and the uh, instruments and, uh, and fora which are existing in the context of this environmental approach you could say if, if it's, it's a little uh, too easy to distinguish there but uh, still to, to make it more, more understandable um, the reference to UNCLOS but we understand that this is a, a, a full concept which cannot be really uh, divided to uh, um, uh, economic like uh, maritime matters, like uh, law of the sea matters, like environmental matters, but it is one, one system, you could say. And this is also something which um, uh, um, uh, uh, led to uh, the well, request of the international community to understand more of this um, environment. But what, what is marine environment? And uh, uh, how can we understand the processes, the, the, the ecosystem as such? And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, something which led to two important decades which are uh, running right now uh, for the uh, period of the 2021 uh, to 2030. Uh, first is the, is the UN decade on ecosystem restoration um, and uh, following this decade the importance for ecosystems in marine and coastal areas and also the uh, UN decade for ocean science for sustainable development and this is um, put on the under the motto the science we need for the ocean we want just saying that we have to understand the system in order to properly protect it but still able to use it so this is something which is uh, of, of great importance uh, to the development of international marine environmental law um, in 2022, uh, as I've um, uh, already uh, mentioned uh, in the uh, um, uh, in the blog on the uh, uh, ocean conferences, we do have uh, the uh, um, the um, uh, second uh, ocean conference, which took place in Lisbon, um, with the outcome document: our ocean, our future, our responsibility. And here you can uh, uh, already uh, see that uh, the, the wording, which we have already covered uh, in, the, um, in the last document, uh, is, is reappearing here again. Uh, and, in, uh, uh, um, and in para three it says we recognize that the ocean is fundamental to life on our planet and to our future. So the language becomes bigger, um, uh, well you could say more important uh, than uh, in the documents before. And when we are speaking about the documents, of course they are non-binding and uh, um, well as a lawyer we usually tend to ask for something which is legally binding and enforceable, uh, but still we have to understand that international law is much more than that and uh, we do not get anything legally binding without a common understanding because we have to get everybody on board and that's basically starting here so it's a, a mental thing well if the international community as a whole or at least as a majority isn't really following this understanding it will not it will not adopt anything which is in the near of being legally binding of course para, para 5 says we reaffirm that climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time and we are deeply alarmed by the adverse effects of climate change on the ocean 
and marine life. In paragraph 10 says we affirm the need to enhance the conservation and sustainable use of oceans and their resources by implementing international law. So basically this is uh, the uh, um, uh, wording from the uh, uh, Ocean Conference in, in uh, 2022 uh, and uh, well we'll see how it uh, will look like next year uh, when we have the next uh, Ocean Conference uh, if they take up also the wording from uh, um, the uh, uh, from the international uh, um, community, you could say, in the, in the fora, for example, of, of UNEP or so. But that will come in a, in a, in a minute. Um, so, when we are speaking of, of uh, today, and this is now, uh, well, filling the, the circle, you could say, uh, of my, uh, of my, uh, um, of the title of my lecture, um, is uh, what is the triple planetary crisis and uh, um, to um, uh, cite Antonio Gutierrez is uh, uh, um, we face a triple planetary crisis a climate emergency that is killing and displacing ever more people each year so this was a statement he made um, uh, at the Stockholm plus 50 international meeting in 2022 and which gives us a, a, a new dimension you could say which um, is let's say a formulation of a vision which has appeared or which developed over the years uh, towards 2022 and as I said starting uh, basically in the 2020s. This is something which uh, um, plays an important role uh, and we have said well binding instruments are of course uh, uh, nice and perhaps also from a legal point of view nicer than only words but still as I said without the understanding we will not reach an agreement on the international scene and uh, uh, one good example uh, is for example the issue of plastic pollution and uh, uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention to a uh, UNEA resolution as I said United Nations Environment, Asse uh, Environment Assembly uh, of uh, the 2nd uh, of March 2023 entitled and plastic pollution towards an international legally binding instrument which is uh, the starting point you could, could say of, uh, of an international agreement on the international uh, uh, stage you could say um, regarding um, uh, the um, um, protection of the marine environment from plastic pollution so there is uh, 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 already, uh, or there are negotiation um, meetings going on. I've given you here, um, just for those who are perhaps particularly interested in, in this issue, also a link to the uh, revi revised draft text uh, of, of uh, April this year. Uh, just to show you that there is a negotiation process and you can see from this very example which is of your time you could say uh, perhaps nicer to read than the historical documents and uh, make you aware that there is a, a kind of a, a, a development uh, permanently going on uh, on, on these uh, issues and uh, um, I've uh, also uh, taken up uh, here the uh, resolution um, uh, 6 slash 15 of UNEA uh, from March this year um, which is on the strengthening of oceans efforts to tackle climate change marine biodiversity loss and pollution and you can see now the wording from uh, 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 um, uh, the uh, uh, Stockholm Plus 50 is already kind of um, uh, matching 
and uh, it might might take uh, take uh, a while uh, until it uh, um, is then part of the uh, international wording uh, uh, in general. We have uh, uh, the um, uh, 1992 uh, United Nations Framework Convention on, on Climate Change, which I've uh, already mentioned in the context of the developments uh, uh, of the Rio conference, with uh, the five key ocean-based climate actions, uh, which are marine conservation, shipping, ocean renewable energy, aquatic food and coastal tourism. And uh, 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 in this year, so in 2024, uh, uh, there is an ocean and climate change dialogue which includes marine di diversity conservation and coastal resilience, uh, sorry, and uh, uh, technology needs for the oceans, uh, climate action including finance risk. So you see the circle is, is growing, um, taking up even more issues. The finance issue is, uh, is uh, uh, coming up. For those who are more on the economical side or more interested on the economical side, might wish to look into to that as well. UNEP is... is um, uh, 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 or has started a, a, a dialogue with the finance sector on uh, environmental uh, uh, issues uh, in order to uh, allow uh, the uh, uh, transformation we, we need uh, for uh, uh, the challenges we face today. But also in different fora, the same issue is popping up and uh, um, I've uh, mentioned in the very beginning IMO, I would also like to mention IMO also uh, in the today's developments uh, of international um, uh, marine environmental law uh, and that is the adoption of the 2023 IMO strategy on reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from ships. Um, and uh, uh, I would also like to cite here uh, one of the uh, key figures, the, uh, um, uh, the IMO Secretary uh, General, um, who at the um, MEPC 80 uh, says the adoption of the 2023 IMO greenhouse gas strategy is a monumental development for IMO and opens a new chapter towards maritime uh, decarbonization. At the same time, it is not the end goal. It is in many ways a starting point for the work that needs to uh, intensify even more over the years and decades ahead of us. However, with the revised strategy that you have now agreed on, we have a clear direction, a common vision, and ambitious targets to guide us to deliver what the world expects from us. So I think there is a lot in these words saying that um, obviously it is a breakthrough and we can celebrate it, but we have to understand that this is still a starting point. But if you see, Let's take it at this, uh, at this moment. Um, if we look back to what I've um, started uh, uh, with IMO, with Stockholm, with Rio, and so on, um, at all these events, uh, it was always a breakthrough. And it was always still only a starting point. And that is something which is common to international law and which shouldn't really disappoint us or frustrate us because if still time is a very important issue in the development of international law. But if you, if you are in a process which is a more, a, which is a democratic process let's say, by involving all the states 
represented in the UN system and you ask them to give their opinion and, and they can constantly object or they can have a different approach or a different view, then we should take that also as a possibility to not, not to take it as a, as a ch only as a challenge, but also to take it as an opportunity to, to rethink, to confirm, perhaps even to concentrate in certain regions or in certain fora, and we will come to that in a, in a few minutes, I just want to make sure that so you you see interruptions are always a challenge I mean it's not only in a lecture it can be for example at an international meeting that for example an important player does not show up or changes his view or a whole region changes his or their, their uh, voting habit or whatever. So uh, it, sometimes I've already noticed that it can also be on a very individual level, like head of delegation does not really get along with another head of a delegation. And that makes us um, we, well, we have to understand that it's, they're all humans. I mean, it's not that there are robots sent to, to meetings, but there are humans and with all the human errors which follow this, uh, this situation, but we are still in a democratic process allowing all to uh, make their voices heard. And this is something which I think is a, is a great gift from this UN system. We all know that there is a lot of shortcomings too. And there's also, of course, a parallel, in parallel a, a development or a, um, um, a process going on within the UN system uh, on UN uh, uh, 2.0 on how to change the system. Because if we understand that there's of course also some, some shortcomings which are actually right now at a very present uh, because of uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, situation, particularly when it comes to the United Nations Security Council. So um, uh, veto powers, are of course something which is of the past. It does not really fit into the today's system. But how can you change it? And to what? How can we better the representation of the today's world? Since we have of course a completely different world from the end of the Second World War, and to that. Another example of uh, what we have uh, just mentioned regarding legally binding instruments uh, is uh, the agreement under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, which is commonly known as the BBNJ agreement from last year and uh, uh, here you can see also from the uh, four main topics of the BBNJ agreement that they um, um, close a gap you could say of UNCLOS uh, which, uh, which, which was important and which is of course also the result of the processes I've just explained since the very early negotiations, um, UNCLOS 1, 2, 3, the Geneva Conventions on the Law of the Sea, the adoption of UNCLOS, the entering into force of UNCLOS, 
the um, judicial decisions uh, and uh, uh, opinions within the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea or International Court of Justice on uh, marine or maritime matters. So this is a full process and this is one of the important results, you could say, with regard to uh, those uh, uh, processes of the past. So, um, uh, as I've uh, already indicated, we are speaking about synergies uh, within uh, the international uh, instruments and fora, particularly uh, in order to cope with the triple planetary crisis. Because if, if we don't do it, we will not be able to cope with that. And uh, I've just given just some of the examples here, and as I've indicated, and many more. Uh, but also, and this is what I would like to um, uh, um, touch upon for uh, the rest of the uh, um, uh, presentation, also with regard to regional, national, local and individual approaches. So uh, don't worry, I'm not going to tell you what you as a single person can do or should do. But on the regional level, I would like to uh, give you some, some idea. And that is something which is not a very new uh, um, concept, but it is also something which was born in the context uh, of the time and the mood of the international community in the early 1970s, when um, the United Nations Environment Programme started the Regional Seas Program in 1974. And also in this context, I should mention that uh, there is a, 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 a rather new Regional Seas Strategic Directions uh, for 2022 to 2025, which aims to more effectively mainstream the conservation and sustainable use of oceans into policies and programs to harmonize methodologies for tracking progress and to foster an integrated response to combat the ecological climate pollution and health crisis for achieving long-term health of the oceans as well as the people who rely on the ocean for um, subsistence of, uh, or otherwise. So, Basically, uh, the um, uh, Regional Seas Programme is uh, something which is another path which still involves the same people. So many of the people being represented in the fora of uh, the Regional Seas Programmes are the same people then going either to Nairobi for UNEP meetings or to New York for, uh, um, for uh, uh, UNCLOS uh, or DOA loss uh, uh, activities. So, um, so we, we have to see that this is uh, also always a, a dialogue process and a, a, a mental process of the people um, forming those uh, policies and, and, and understandings. Um, the regional seas programs I've uh, just mentioned here, the ones uh, which are of, uh, uh, from an EU interest or EU perspective, you could say. Um, there are uh, uh, many more worldwide and uh, uh, there are different ones like uh, UNEP, administered ones or uh, independent ones. But uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, 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 differentiate here today since it isn't the, the right place to do so. But I would like to, to show you that it is covering basically uh, most of the uh, marine regions worldwide. Uh, and from uh, this you can see it already from the EU perspective that it is uh, covering uh, everything which is uh, under um, uh, our, our interest here. And from the Mediterranean, uh, I've uh, um, uh, given you here uh, the example uh, of uh, the uh, Barcelona Convention, not to shock you by all the details and dates, but to, 
to show you the, the progress here again uh, from the uh, early 1970s uh, until uh, basically today uh, the revision uh, also again in, in the uh, 1990s but also the uh, different protocols then concentrating on different aspects within the protection of the marine environment. But regional does not automatically mean that it is uh, always something which has to be very much focused on marine environment uh, uh, as such, but also something which is uh, rather broader than that. And uh, uh, one of the examples which are uh, regularly mentioned by the United Nations with regard to a um, a, a positive role model, you could say, uh, is for example the European Green Deal from uh, 2019 uh, for um, uh, uh, the protecting, uh, protection of biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, reducing air, water and soil pollution, moving towards a circular economy, improving waste management, and ensuring the sustainability of our blue economy and fishery sector. So this is something which the European Union has developed in order to um, find a solution for our region and the possibilities we do have in our region. Meaning that, uh, of course, when we are negotiating on an international level, uh, it is not always, uh, uh, or, or, well, the situation isn't that you, you ask who wants what uh, and it is a, a, a free choice, but you always have to kind of uh, refinance all your activities, obviously. So there is a difference of possibilities in different regions and uh, the European Green Deal is trying to t uh, uh, take into consideration the financial uh, but also the technological uh, uh, possibilities and the willingness of the EU member states towards achieving more than the international community has agreed upon. And this is a con or this is an understanding which is uh, in place since the very early beginning. So when it comes, for example, to uh, IMO matters or to um, uh, or to, uh, let's say, environmental matters, um, uh, we are always speaking about minimum standards, you could say. You have to follow what is internationally agreed. But you may, of course, um, go beyond that. You can, you can of course, uh, be more stringent or you can put up a, a higher threshold uh, for your own people and your own economies. Obviously, since we are so much interlinked also on an uh, um, economical and trade uh, uh, um, uh, aspects, you cannot do only what you, what you like to do because of the international competition situation. But still, we do have a different approach here uh, uh, for the European Union and this is also why I've uh, uh, decided to mention that in this uh, context here as well. But this is, well, beyond the regional, we do also have different uh, possibilities to, um, to enforce and to speed up certain activities or certain positions on the international scale. And we have seen that within the past, or few past years, um, well, courts um, have been asked to decide on environmental issues on different grounds. And I thought it would be um, uh, completing the picture to mention in this context also uh, the human rights to be used to address environmental issues. And uh, um, you can see from the United Nations Gen General Assembly Resolution uh, 76-300, 
the human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment from 2022, which is based on the um, uh, resolution of the Human Rights Council um, uh, with the same title uh, from the year before, uh, that this is um, uh, also a possibility to further develop and to put some pressure on the issue, you could say, um, uh, on the, also on the uh, international uh, scene. And uh, uh, so this is something which I think uh, has to be considered uh, in the further development uh, also of the, uh, of the uh, uh, development of International Marine Environmental year, uh, uh, Law in the years to come. I've mentioned uh, uh, law, law dis or court decisions already. Uh, and I would like to mention in this context also uh, the uh, um, international decisions and opinions of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea uh, uh, class in, in Hamburg, which is operating since uh, 1994, since, well, the uh, entering into force of UNCLOS, and it's a uh, chamber for marine environmental disputes. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, I, I would also like, of course, to uh, point out that there is a, a request for an advisory opinion submitted by the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law right now at the Tribunal. And, uh, well, the decision is, uh, well, due within the next or uh, in 11 days. Uh, the ones interested may, may look into the live broadcasting. Uh, it will definitely uh, be an interesting, uh, uh, well, uh, an, interest, an interesting opinion uh, and uh, uh, will uh, take, take the international scholars uh, for uh, long nights to interpret and uh, to, to read into it, so it will be an exciting time to come. Um, beside, of course, uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, we do have uh, the International Court of Justice, who traditionally deals also with uh, 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 well, uh, issues of uh, law of the sea and international marine environmental law, as well as the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which has uh, uh, influenced the, uh, 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 the development of international marine environmental law uh, 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 as well. Uh, and also the International Criminal Court, which uh, uh, allows uh, there for um, as, as I've mentioned already in the context of the uh, hum human rights aspect, also uh, the possibility of using international criminal law in order to um, uh, address environmental issues. So um, that's the quick ride I uh, promised. I hope I haven't lost too many over the uh, past uh, 50 minutes. Um, thank you very much for your attention and your patience uh, and I'm happy to uh, uh, discuss and also to uh, well try to answer any questions if there are any. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.